Hallelujah, hallelujah. God is good. And he is faithful. And that means that he's consistent. And people are inconsistent, but God is faithful. That means he's always the same. People change. We change. He never changes. And that's why we can we stand on the word and Jesus said this that I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what that means, what you read in the Bible is how I'm, I, I'm still that person. I still heal, restore, save, love, and reach out to the least person. When Jesus was on earth, he used to be criticized a lot by religious people. You think about, like, who criticized him? Church people. And, and he did things differently than they did it because what ended up happening with the church people, they were very judgmental and critical, and we called it legalistic. They were always trying to catch someone doing something wrong. That was their goal. And then their goal was we could catch them doing something wrong, then we could punish them. We did our job. They were acting like they were the, the Holy Ghost police. We're going to get you. And when Jesus came to earth, he came to reach sinners. And you can't reach sinners if you don't go to them and talk to them. And what Jesus would do is hang around people that no, no religious teacher or rabbi or priest of the day would ever associate themselves with. Jesus did not just hang out with them once in a while. He would hang out with them all the time. And the religious leaders would say this, why are you hanging out with these sinners? And then Jesus answered this. He says, the, the, the healthy don't need a doctor. It's the sick that need a doctor. I didn't come for the righteous, but I came for sinners. Come on, give God some praise. You know what that means? He hasn't changed. And if, if you feel, man, I'm a sinner, I messed up, then Jesus is drawn close to you today. He's not here to judge you. He's here, he's here to save you. It's important, though, to recognize that you need saving. You're, you're never going to be saved thinking, oh, I'm okay. Everyone that's in denial doesn't get any help. And even Alcoholics Anonymous know this. Unless you admit you got an alcoholic problem, you're going to remain an alcoholic. That means that you're, it's never, you're never going to overcome it. it will, you will continue being an addiction, in an addiction, an addiction because you're in denial. I'm not in denial. I need some help. Come on, is there anybody else say, I, I need some help. I, I, I have emotional problems. I got mental problems. I got family issues. I got identity issues. I'm not sure who I am. I'm confused about my future. I'm worried. I'm full of anxiety. I'm depressed. I'm bipolar. I'm schizophrenic. I'm going crazy. I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, whatever it is. Whatever your diagnosis is, right? God can handle your diagnosis. Old things pass away, and everything becomes new for everyone that's in Christ. That means, come on, you don't have to leave here with an identity. Come on, with a, th that the enemy has given you a name that the enemy has given you. Give God some praise that He transforms people. He transforms people. All right, we're we're covering some heavy subjects, and the Bible we Bible talks about the last days. And the question is, are we in the last days? The last days means, are we close to Jesus coming back? Now, when Jesus, Jesus was asked that question, what are the last days going to look like? There were certain signs that he gave. These are signs that you would see. And the scripture also gives us signs that we might be entering those last days that Jesus could come at any moment in any time. Uh, we don't know when he's coming, but we could at least look at the signs. And whatever signs that there would be, that means that they, they would, this is what they would do. They would be like birth pains. They would start off light and they would increase and increase and increase and increase until finally Jesus comes back. Right now we're experiencing some birth pains or signs that Jesus Christ could come back. We're going to be covering sign number eight again. 
and we're going to dive deeper into it. And we're going to be talking about in the last days there will be an apostasy or the Bible says there will be a great falling away. That means that believers will become unbelievers if they're not alert. There's a lot of people, there's a new, new thing out there. It's called de deconstruction. And that means there's believers that are re-looking at their faith and putting doubt in it and not believing what they used to believe. we got worship leaders that are saying, I don't believe in God anymore. And some of those people don't believe in God because someone let them down or a leader let them down and they got church hurt. Just because you got church hurt doesn't mean there's not a God. You serve God, you don't serve people. Now, if you walk out on church because somebody hurt you, understand that's a really bad idea because Jesus saved you. And you're going to be in a church with a whole bunch of people that have issues, and you're going to have to learn how to forgive. That's how you grow. How many understand that? You don't run when you have some issues. You deal with them. We're going to be talking about the last days, and it's going to be really interesting. Uh, young adults, uh, teenagers, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to church. I will equip you to be able to deal with the doctrines of demons that you're going to be facing today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life. You're going to know what to say. You're going to be able to identify it and be able to resist it with the word of God. Come on. We got to learn how to fight this stuff. It's a fight of faith. It's a fight of faith. It's a fight of faith. It's a fight of what you believe. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you. Holy Spirit, reveal to us your word. Give us conviction and boldness of your Holy Spirit. Father, we're not here to brainwash people. We're here to introduce them to you. You're the Savior. You're the Deliverer. You're the one that makes a Father, old person, brand new. You're the one that sets a drug addict free. You're the one, Father God, that turns someone that's addicted to pornography and he sets them free to be holy and free, Father. You take the least of them and you turn them in, Father, to minister the people that everybody forgot about, think, thought they'd never work, but Father, you call them you change them you transform them holy spirit may we have an encounter with you tonight in the mighty name of jesus we pray amen let's give god some praise so glad that you're here tonight you can have a seat if you're here for the first time we're going to go through some scriptures about the last days let's turn to second thessalonians 2 3 and it says let no one in any way deceive or entrap you the traps will come, the deception will come through people. Satan uses people. People aren't the devil, he just uses them. And if you're not aware, you could be trapped or you could be deceived. These people no longer need to be close to you. You could just turn on your social media, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, or whatever you turn into, and they can begin to speak into your life. Everything that's on the internet doesn't come from God and it's not neutral. There's actually things on the internet that are demonic plans to deceive and destroy and trap you by trapping your thinking. If we looked at your YouTube, your Instagram, and we look at your history, what would it show today? What videos were you watching? Who was speaking into your life? Something to think about. Even leaders, think about this. Who are you allowing to speak into your life? And it's no wonder after you're watching stuff that doesn't come from God, you end up trapped, you end up deceived, and you end up doubtful. You used to believe, but you're becoming a little less convinced because you're tuning in to deceiving messages. For that day will not come, the day when Jesus comes back, will not come unless the apostasy, apostasy comes first. Jesus is coming back. He said, but it won't, it won't happen until there's an apostasy. And this is what it means. That is the great rebellion, the abandonment of faith by professed Christians. 
There's going to be abandonment of faith, not of the world, because they never had faith. There can't be a falling away of people that were never there. We're talking about believers are going to be deceived. Believers are going to be trapped. They're going to fall away. Now, once believers fall away, there's no resistance for the enemy's false doctrines to, to stand. False doctrines are going to replace truth. Only because there's not a re enough resistance on earth. Your family will be deceived and entrapped unless you're full of the word of God and full of faith. If you're barely a believer that doesn't study the word, doesn't know the word, doesn't speak the word, understand this, your family will be trapped and deceived. They will not be equipped to fall away, to be equipped to stand against the enemy. The Bible says you shall know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Truth is what sets you free from deception and lies, not willpower. Look at it says, there will be a great rebellion, the abandonment of the faith by professed Christians. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, the Antichrist, the one who is destined to be destroyed. After there's a fallen away of believers, the next stage we're going to see is the Antichrist, which is Satan coming in the form of a man that's going to end up rising up as a world and religious leader on earth. It's going to be easy for him to do it because there will be hardly any resistance on the earth. And what I mean by that is the spirit of apostasy, the spirit of the Antichrist is already here. Believers are intimidated. Believers no longer live holy lives. Believers no longer depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. Believers no longer love the word of God. Believers are easily offended and hurt and destroyed and tempted and taken away from the church and taken away from their call and taken away from their ministry. There's a great falling away. Apostasy. This is what it means. A fallen away, a defection, a forsaken, a total departure from the principles and commands of the word of God. I'm walking away from God. They say, I used to be a believer. I used to be involved in ministry. I used to go to church. And what happened? What deceived you? What trapped you? What devil took over your mind and your faith. Now, there's going to be three teachings of doctrines of demons that will be practiced in the last days of the apostasy. Three, three false religions, I'll say this, three apostasies, three doctrines and teachings of demons. In 1 Timothy 4.1, look what it says. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, it's referring to the apostasy, some will turn away from the, from the true faith. Some will turn, not everybody, because we're not turning away. We're standing. And as long as we're here, and I'm not just talking about the way, as long as there's a church that believes in the word of God, filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on, lives by the commands of Jesus Christ. There will be resistance on earth and the enemy will just not have his way and bulldoze his way in your family, in your neighborhood, in your city, because there's some resistance here. The Bible says submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Is there anybody submitted to God and ready to resist the devil's lies? But it says this, last time sun will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive, seducing spirits and teachings or doctrines that come from demons. What does it say follow? They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings and doctrines 
that come from demons. That there's actually philosophies, ideas that were birthed in hell. They come from Satan to deceive and trap mankind so that they don't believe and call on Jesus to save them. See, when you're deceived, you think you're right and you're actually wrong. I'm good. No, you're not. Well, I got a lot of people telling me I'm good. It doesn't matter how many people tell you you're good. Unless God tells you you're in the right place, you're in trouble. All we have is the word of God that, will, that our faith is based on. And if you don't believe the word of God and you're turning away from God and you're turning away from the church, you're falling away. And once you fall away, you fall for doctrines, teachings, philosophies, and perspectives of demons. And it's all around us. But it said they will follow. Interesting, the word follow. Today that word has more relevance than ever. Every social media influencer asks for us to follow and subscribe. Who are you following and subscribing? Or who are you following that you need to unsubscribe? Because they're pushing doctrines of demons. The Bible says that in the last, the Bible says, he goes, I'd rather you hot or cold. But the lukewarm, he goes, I will spew out of my mouth. What he's saying, lukewarm believers are obnoxious. It's getting quiet there, I'm seeing. Say it with me, doctrines of demons. I'm going to give you three doctrines of demons. One of them is Gnostic dualism. It's a doctrine of demons. It's a religion that says that your physical body has nothing to do with your true self. Your true self is purely metaphysical or mental. For example, your body can be male and your true self be female or vice versa. This religion was deemed to be a heresy over four, over a thousand years ago in Western civil, civilization, but it's back to stay. Du Gnostic dualism said that the real you is not your body but it's the way you think, your metaphysical you. It was deemed to be a heresy a thousand years ago. Why did it not work a thousand years ago? Because there was a church full of the word of God, and when they heard the demonic doctrine, they resisted it right out of society. They stood up and they called the teachers heretics. That's from the devil. That's not from God. That's not scripture. And they shut it down. Why is this doctrine revived from hell today? Because there's a great falling away. The enemies knows now. The church is not going to say nothing. They're intimidated. They don't want to be persecuted. They don't want to be resisted. They love themselves so much, they don't care who goes to hell. Their God is comfort. They've already fallen away. They call themselves rich, but they're actually poor and naked spiritually. We're in the last days, but I thank God that God is raising up, come on, a group of people that are going to be full of the Holy Spirit and are going to be able to resist all these doctrines of demons. Now, when you go to school, you're going to be able to say, when they start going through all the pronouns, you're going to say, oh, that's Gnostic. That, that's right there, Gnostic dualism. I know what that is. I want you to look at this video. It's a parent in a church, great falling away, they're having a service 
And in this service, they're actually coming out and saying what's their gender. The problem is this boy is only four years old. And his mom is forcing him to identify as a girl. Gnostic dualism. Take a look at this video. Today we choose to recognize, honor, love, and celebrate anyone here who would claim their identity publicly as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning, intersex, pansexual, asexual, or any category that I've left out. <laughs> this is Phoenix. Phoenix is, looks like four years old. Oh, looks like a little shy. Girl. Do you want to tell everyone if you're a boy or a girl? I just want to tell them that I'm a girl. Okay, you can tell them that. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Phoenix would like you to know that she's a girl and she prefers she and her pronouns. May you be well, safe, and whole. We honor you exactly as you are. Now, right now, you know, uh, when we started this series, uh, uh, we we're talking about how many genders there are. I told you that there were, we start off like with 12 and then we went over 100. And now as they're discussing it more, they're saying it's infinite. What they're saying, as, mu as, as, as much as there are thoughts, there are genders. We're living in a time where we're redefining everything, including basic biology. I was at the store the other day, and I have a grandson, and he's a boy. And he'll always be a boy. Right? I train him. I'm in the store. I'm in the store. And he's starting to move towards a girl doll. And I told him, no, that's a girl's toy. You're a boy. Now, when I said that, a girl walks by and she says this, let him be whatever he wants to be. Now, 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 I want you to check this. She walked by and said it. She didn't stop. She just walked by. Let him be what he wants to be. Right? She didn't stop. She just kept walking. And I just looked at her. I go, you're bold. I go, I go but, but this is what I thought. This is what I thought. Is she more bold than Christians? Because she, her stronghold said, do not accept that. Because this is not what you believe. And she addressed it. She captured that thought and pulled it back into obedience to Satan. If you don't become that way when you hear something that's demonic and you don't address it and make it submit to Christ, you're going to fall. The devil ain't playing and it's time for Christians to know what they believe. And when they hear something that's a demonic doctrine, you say something in love. The second demonic doctrine is hedonism. It's a doctrine of demons. It comes from the ancient Greek word for pleasure. It describes a belief that the pursuit of pleasure and self-gratification is the highest goal for human life. It results in a constant quest for pleasure and satisfaction. And 2 Timothy 3, 4 says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves, narcissistic, self-centered, and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God. So you're one of those people that believe this, the Bible? Don't you know that the Bible is written by man? They have no proof of that. They've just been swallowing 
the doctrines of demons. Because the truth is, the word of God is inspired by God, breathed by God. It's infallible. It's perfect. It's never been proven wrong. After all the atheists and the skeptics for generation, for generation, thousands of years, they still have not been able to debunk the Bible because the Bible is the word of God and you could build your foundation for your morals, your family on the scripture. Right and wrong come from the word. Look at this. They will consider nothing sacred, nothing sacred anymore. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They'll be cruel and hate what is good, hate what is good. They'll betray their friends, be reckless, puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They'll love pleasure rather than God. This society will be pleasure and lust driven. If you feel it, go for it. There would be no denial of a lower nature. Every single one of us have desires. And just because you have desires, not all your desires are good. Some of the desires that we have are nasty, dirty, Wrong, evil, hurtful, self-destructive. It's true. And you recognize it because you tell yourself after you indulge in the desire, you start thinking, your conscience starts speaking to you, and you start saying, man, I better stop that. But there's a problem. Unless Jesus sets you free, you can't stop it. Monday through Thursday, you're white knuckling until Friday comes around and you go on another bad run. Or you go two months good and one month bad. Not every desire that you have is a good desire. Some of them are just pleasure driven. In 2 Peter 3.3 3 says this, first of all, I want you to know that in the last days, men will laugh at the truth. They're going to mock Christians. Can you handle someone laughing at you and you still standing? You can laugh at me all you want. But the truth is, I already know what, I, the, this, I, the, I already know the truth. Come on, is there anybody that knows the truth, that understands that people that are, that are proposing and selling demonic doctrines, they're actually selling untruths. And it's getting worse than that. They're selling unscientific proofs. It's not even science no more. Is that right? So now there'll be hedonism. Pleasure will lead. And if it's pleasurable, do it. You'll watch out. You'll, you'll be involved in a sin and then you'll tell yourself something like this when you're, hedon, hedon, when you're practicing hedonism. It's not hurting nobody. Laws is not hurting nobody. I'm good. Really? So the porn that you're watching is not hurting nobody. First of all, it's hurting you. It's hurting your family. It's messing up your mind. Come on. What about the girl that's been turned out so you can watch her and have your thrills with her on, on video? That's somebody's daughter. The, the third demonic doctrine will be secular humanism. It's the doctrine of demons. This is a man-centered belief system and religion that says nothing has a spiritual basis and, not, and, nothing, and nothing to do with God. It is a belief that is bound, is not bound to any rules or laws. It says that man is a measure of all things. Happiness is the goal of a secular humanist, not right and wrong. It is based on Darwinian evolution. Secular humanists do not believe in God or the afterlife. 
In 2014, a federal district court held secular humanism as a religion. It's a society that's doing everything they can to get rid of God. Take God out of it. We don't want God. We don't want rules. We're the center of society, and we determine what's right and wrong, not God. Not Bible, not the church. I am my own God. I determine my destiny. I'm living for this life. There's only one life to live, and I'm going to live it to the fullest. It's all a lie. In the last days, secular humanism is going to, is going to show up like this. People will refuse to worship God and make themselves, and they will make themselves the center of the universe. Look at Romans 1.20. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Has anybody ever seen the earth and sky? Come on. Have you seen the earth and sky? Right. Now, the idea of this portion of scripture is saying this. If there's a creation, there's a creator. Well, I don't believe in that. I believe in evolution. Oh, so you believe in the scientific impossibility that something, everything was created from nothing. You got to believe that. Everything came from nothing. Scientifically impossible. You can't even tell a scientist to go into a laboratory and create a grain of sand from nothing. Much less the intelligent design of this world. Though everything God, look at this. Through everything God made, they, are, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. No one is born an atheist. No one is born an agnostic. You have to be trained to be an atheist. And you have to be, come on, you have to be trained to be an agnostic. You watch some videos or talk to some people and this is the reason. We don't want God to tell us what to do, so we want to eliminate God you could try to eliminate God, but creation every single day is going to present itself to you and say, I'm here. Look at all the evidence around you. And that's why we came up with the theory of evolution. Understand it's still a theory. Look at this. Church, I'm preparing you. For since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky, though everything God made they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, every single person knew God. But they wouldn't worship him as God, secular humanism. Or give him thanks. I don't want to give him any credit for my life. I don't want to give him credit for my breath. I don't want to give him credit for my talent. It's all me. So funny, it's all you. And when you die, you take nothing with you. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. I'm going to ask a question and we're going to answer it here. Now we're going to get deep into this now. We're, th today, you're going to get every, almost every scripture on homosexuality and what the Bible clearly says about it. Now understand, you can believe it or you can reject it. Rejecting is saying, I refuse to worship you. I refuse to give you any credit. I refuse to acknowledge you as my creator. I do what I want to do in my life, secular humanism. And Romans 1.24, this is a question we're going to answer. What is the end result of a society that refuses to worship God and practices secular humanism? What will be the result? I'm right, you know what we're doing right now? I'm giving you a college course on, on these subjects. So when you go to college and you go to work and you go home, you know what to say and you know the truth. Oh, that's secular humanism. That's not, that right, that, that right there, I already know what that is. That's hedonism. That's, that's Gnostic dualism. So what happens when a society says, 
God out, we're in. We determine. We're the gods. We make rules and we make gods in our own image. We want gods, a god, to look like us. I heard Oprah Winfrey, a little segment she said, she said, I take personal responsibility if I go to hell. She said this. She goes, but I do know this, that my God, who, who's your God? You just made up one? <laughs> Wouldn't send anybody to hell. You know what that's called? Human reasoning. You're trying, to, you're trying to make God come down to your level. But his thoughts are higher than yours. His ways are higher than yours. And he's a holy God. And understand, if the severity of our sin wasn't that serious, he would have never sent his son to die for us. So what's the end result? Number one, confusion. Minds will become dark and confused. There will be no sense of what's right and wrong or what their identity is. The scripture says this, because it, so they abandoned, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. And the Bible says that their hearts became dark and confused. Blind, to be led astray or into error and thought, conduct and judgment. They're, they would be confused. They'd become foolish, not knowing what to think, to be or do. There'd be lack of clarity and certainty. A refusal to worship God, the one and only true God, causes us to create a God in our own image, a God we can control and define as we wish, a God that accepts and celebrates our sinful lifestyle and doesn't demand repentance. We start saying stuff like that. God, my God wouldn't judge me. He accepts me the way I am. Now I'm going to say this. You could come the way you are but he'll never leave you the way you are. Someone say confusion. The second result, look in, in Romans 1.24, I'll read that again. So God abandoned them because they refused to worship God. God says you can have your way. Do what you want. I give you free will. If a society decides we don't want God in school we don't want God in our lives. We don't want rules. We don't want, what the, we don't want the Bible. We want to live our hedonistic lifestyles. We want to define everything. We want to be God. God says, okay, do it. Let's see how it works out for you. And we're doing that. And we're more depressed than ever. We're more suicidal than ever. We are, come on, our families are falling apart. Our minds are falling apart. We're crazier than ever. Come on, we got more sickness than ever. What's happening? We're doing it our way. Look what it says. So God abandoned them to whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Now let's take a look at this. Number two thing that's going to happen is lust will be king. It will be a society that is left led by their shameful desires. That word shameful desire, God says, you don't want to worship me? I'll, I'll let you go with your desires. And God calls those desires shameful. What he means by that is their lust. Is it is, lust is a desire that is forbidden by God. It's sin. So you want to go do your way, I'll let you. I'll give you up to your sinful desires. Number three, a, desire, a, a society that refuses to worship God and practices secular humanism will eventually, number three, homosexuality will become a prevalent and promoted lifestyle. When I say prevalent and promoted, we're going to cover a scripture right now in just a second. But prevalent and promoted. Right now, just I would say two decades ago, those that, that actually identified as LGBTQIA plus now were right around 4%. In la the last decade, Generation Z it's over 21%. So we're, we're not seeing a trend. We're seeing exponential growth. 
Why? Because there's not enough resistance on earth. There's nobody talking truth. Those that are falling for lies, they need someone to love them enough to let them know that there's a way out. You can be born again. You can have a new identity. As a child of God, God can give you new desires. But if you say nothing, they can't repent. You don't love them if you don't say nothing. Look at this video. It's getting crazy. We got another mother. Does your mom say you have to That's be right LGBT? Um, no. no, I can oh, choose what I want to be, but some. T but go ahead, Lex. Go ahead, keep talking. Say what you're saying. Um, my mom doesn't matter if I'm up, if I am gay or lesbian or any of that. She doesn't care. All she cares about is that I'm a part of it. And if I'm not a part of it, she'll try to convince me to uh, um, get, join it. Cause I. What are you saying right now? Facts. That I would convince you to join what? The LGBTQIA plus. It would be uh, see when when we're living in secular under secular humanism, there are no rules. And what happens is we start falling for the doctrines of demons, and we as parents, if we don't watch it. Instead of teaching them the commands of the Lord, you start keep teaching the commands of Satan. Instead of converting the followers of Jesus Christ, you begin to you begin to speak to them and push them to be converts of a lifestyle that God calls sin. We can't rewrite the Bible or edit it. Look what the Bible says. Verse 26, that is why, so we refuse to worship God, secular humanism. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Say, say with me, shameful desires. Now, in this portion of scripture, it now defines what's a shameful desire. And it says this, even the women turned against the natural way to have sex. Instead, indulge in sex with each other or women having sex with women. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relationship, relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. So the Bible, how does it describe homosexuality? Number one, it calls it vile. Unclean, immoral, highly offensive, filthy, and repulsive. It calls it detestable. In Leviticus 18.22, it says, do not practice homosexuality, having sex with, other, with another man as with a, as with a woman, is a detestable sin. That word detestable means it's an abomination. Something that is to be despised and rejected. Not to personally to accept into our lives. The scripture is saying not every desire you're supposed to accept. Just because you have the desire, I understand. There's desires that I have that I have to constantly reject. I know it's not right. I know it's sin. So I reject it. And this is what happens. The more I reject it, the less power it has over my life. What you give into and you feed grows. What you resist dies. Do not practice homosexuality. It calls it a sin. It calls it unnatural and abnormal. Unnatural and abnormal sex. And that does make sense. Because anything that's unnatural and abnormal or unnormal can't produce nothing. Because it's not, produ it's not, it's not being used in its intended purpose. 
It doesn't matter how many times a girl and a girl get together, they can't produce a child together. A man and man cannot produce a child together because it's abnormal. It's not normal. The Bible calls it not normal sex. And not normal sex is another way to say it is perversion. And perversion means this, any of various means of obtaining sexual gratification, that is, this is a dictionary definition. Understand this, I didn't look this up in some Bible dictionary. It was just Webster's. Any of the, any of the various means of obtaining sexual gratification that is unnatural or abnormal. It means to lead astray morally, to turn from the right course, to turn to an improper use, misapply, to bring to a less excellent state, to change to what is unnatural or to change to what is unnatural and abnormal. So it calls it unnatural and abnormal or perverse. God calls cross-dressing detestable. So you might say, what about transgender stuff? Well, here it is. In Deuteronomy 22.5, now understand this. This is not a bastion. This is a standard so we can start living the full life that God has for us. And what I mean by that is if we live this way, we're not going to be happy. We're never going to have joy. We're never going to have peace. And the last thing, we'll never have a relationship with God and we'll never live for eternity. It's not worth it. When we're in sin, the truth is we're miserable. And if you're involved in a lifestyle that the Bible calls sin, I know this, it's going to end in misery. It's going to end with suicidal thoughts. It's going to end in confusion. It's going to end in anger. It's going to end in heartbreak. And God is saying, I didn't create you to live like that. And I know it's hard right now because you've been introduced to it and you've given yourself to it. And there's a lot of sins that we've given ourselves to. But there's somebody here that's a drug addict and your mom might have introduced you to the drugs. And I know it's hard to quit, but there has to be a time where you trust in Jesus to set you free and make you new. Sin is sin and it brings bondage. But there's a God that can set you free and give you new desires. He could save you. In Deuteronomy 22.5, a woman must not put on men's clothing. Shouldn't do that. If you're a woman, you should have women's clothes. A man must not wear women's clothing. So if you're a man, you shouldn't be dressing like a girl, even in secret. Because that's where it starts. And then the enemy starts telling you, well, you know, you have this fetish to dress like a girl. You must be this. And he starts identifying you. Instead of you resisting your sin and saying, God set me free from this, you start giving yourself into it. You become a slave to it, and it becomes your identity. Anyone, look at this. Anyone who does this is, de is, is detestable in the sight of the Lord, your God. Now, I know these are hard scriptures, but it's truth. And I love you enough to bring out these scriptures in 2022. Come on, we got we to gotta, we gotta help our kids out. Come on, parents, you got to help your kids out. You got to help your friends out at school. You got, come on, you got to stand up in class. I know what that is. And you start standing up so people could get set free. And if we don't talk about it, nobody be set free. We just had a young lady come in yesterday. I just saw her and she's married to another woman. And she, she goes, I'm done. I want to live for God. I'm, I'm, I'm empty. I'm struggling. I, I need some freedom. Come on, we got some guys that are struggling with homosexuality. And this week they're saying, come on, I'm tired of the lifestyle. I realize it's detestable. I don't like it. I want to get set free. And you'll never get set free until you start calling sin the way and God seeing sin the way God sees it. Stop acting like it's cute.
It's so serious, it could destroy your life forever. Now, there's two options that would be done. You could admit that you're sinning and we're sinning with a willingness to repent of the sins and believe in Jesus, and you could be saved. You could be forgiven. You could become a brand new person with new desires. Come on, God, come on, God save sinners like me and you. First John 1 John 1.9, it says, if we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, admit that it's a sin, confess that it's a sin, he is faithful and just and true to his own nature and promises and will forgive our sins and will forgive our sins. He's not going to judge our sins. He's going to forgive our sins. He'll cleanse us. He'll cleanse us continually from all unrighteous wrongdoing and everything that's not in conformity with his will. He's saying, I will set you free. I will make you new. I'll give you new desires. Come on, I'll take away the urge and put a new urge in you. If you just confess, it's a sin. Or option number two. You can reject Jesus and not believe and be punished for eternity in the lake of fire. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, it says, And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted. And also for us, when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flame and fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God, and those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's really simple. You could accept it or reject it. But look what it says here. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. Now, I've learned this, that the longer we live apart from God, the more separated we feel already. We feel lonely feel depressed, we feel rejected, we feel like the whole world's coming against us. And it causes us to try to medicate our pain and we search in all kinds of different directions for identity and purpose. I get it. We're all the same. I remember when I was a kid, I didn't know who I was going to be, especially in junior high, I didn't know. I was trying to be everything. I was a gangbanger one week. I was a surfer the next week, and I lived in Fontana. We, didn't, we weren't even close to the beach. I was a punk rocker. I just, I mean, I just, who am I? And now the devil's given more opportunities. Infinite identities that are demonic to capture you. Because once you say, I'm this, and you look at it as your identity, you can't be, you can't repent for something that you don't call sin. Understand this, no matter what lifestyle you're in today, it doesn't matter. God's saying, I'll forgive you if you just admit it. I'll cleanse you if you just admit it. I'll give you new life if you just admit it. I'll help you if you just admit it. I'll set you free. I don't want to just help you. I'm not trying to hurt you. Today's your day. How many want to receive from, how many want to receive everything God has? Just all stand up. I'm going to dismiss in just a second. Are you learning something here? Come on. We're, I'm going to dismiss just so no one leave yet because I want to make sure that while you're leaving, you don't take a, a sinner who's supposed to be saved with you. Okay. Let's give God credit and honor in this moment. I want you, and I want you to get this. I'm not trying to convince your mind because if you could be con convinced, you could be unconvinced. I want you to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. He'll save you. He'll give you a new heart. For some of you, you're going to get rest tonight as you surrender your sin to God. The tormenting thoughts are going to go. The shame is going to go. Because God's not mad at you. And I love you. you say, no, you don't. You, you're messing up my lifestyle. You're messing. I'm not trying to mess with your lifestyle. I want to introduce you to the true lifestyle. I'm just saying, I'm just letting you know that. And understand, parents, if you have a son or daughter that's struggling with this, don't beat yourself up. We're in a world, man, it's tough. What I want you to do is just stand and intercede and pray for them, love them, and win them over. 
And as the door opens, you share. If they're not ready to hear, don't force it yet. Live it out. Maybe they need to know you love them first before you could speak to them next. Okay, and I know it's rough. But, it, but if anybody's looking for something in this world, they're looking for love. And, you know, the banner of, you know, of, of the LGBTQIA community plus is, you know, love is love. And you know what that means? I'm saying I want to be loved. And, and really love is not just love, love. Every love is not the right love. There's some real bad loves out there. Some of us love things you shouldn't be loving. But the real love that you're looking for that can make you whole and complete is the love of God. He loves you. Okay, so I pray for you tonight. I pray for you tonight that you'll surrender. And church, let's stand up bold. I empower the teenagers. I empower the young adults. I empower the church to shine light with love. Come on, truth with love. Help somebody. Come on, they're hurting. They're broken. They're suicidal. They need your help. We're not helping nobody by appeasing it. We got to let, we got to let them know. I love you. There is an answer. How many know Jesus is the answer? Christian, will you close us? Next week, next week we're going to be talking about abortion. What does the Bible say about abortion? And I'm, you're going to be surprised when life begins according to God. It's going to trip you out. Okay, you want to know, huh? Okay, we're going to know. We're going to have a biblical understanding about abortion. You got to understand that? If you, if you have had an abortion, this is not going to be a bashing on that. It's going to be understanding of what has happened. And no matter what you've done, you could be forgiven and you could be healed and you could be restored. You don't have to live in the past. It doesn't matter. We don't care about that. We don't care about where anybody's at, where you've been going. All that can be turned around with Jesus. Come on. Your mistakes can be turned around. You're not your failure. You're not your darkest moment. You're not your mistake. That's not who you are, okay? We love you. We love you. Aren't you? God loves you so much. He sent his son to die for you. So you're going to get an opportunity in the next 90 seconds to make a choice. Jesus is knocking a heart door and he's saying, I came for you, not to judge you, but to help you, to restore you. And all I want to be is your father. And I just want you to be my daughter. I'll take care of you. Come on. And some of you guys don't even know what that is because your father's never been there. But your heavenly father wants to introduce himself to you. And he loves you. And you're a pleasure. You're an apple of his eye. He loves you. Let's pray. I'm going to receive that word tonight. You know, Pastor, he had his last two points very clear. Right now in this moment, we have options to respond to the word and the truth that God has given us. And just know this, that the fact that God has given us the option to respond is, didn't, it doesn't come from us. It's actually God reaching out to you, tugging on your heart and pulling you towards his love, his healing, his forgiveness and his breakthrough. At the end of every service, we give an opportunity for everybody to respond to the love of Jesus. And before anyone else leaves, we have an opportunity right now to make a the greatest decision we could ever make. The Bible makes it clear, we've all sinned. How many know that's true? Whether there was any sin that was talked about today or sin that maybe you've committed, a sin that you've been in, we've all fallen short, which is why we need a Savior the Bible says the price or the wage of our sin is death. It's eternal separation from God. It's hell forever. It's a price. That the only way we can pay for our sins is hell for eternity. Eternity never ends. It goes on forever and ever and ever. You can do a trillion years in hell and you still have not scratched the surface. But because God loved us so much... The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, which means while we were actively living as an enemy of God, God made a way for you to be free and forgiven. That's true love. It's easy to love somebody that's lovable, but true love is loving someone that betrays you and rejects you and spits in your face. That was us towards God, and he loved you enough to make a way. Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sin. So now, to be saved, we can put our faith in Jesus Christ, which means we can make him our Lord and Savior. 
we can, we can turn in our life and receive his forgiveness because he paid the price for our sin. We can be made whole and declared righteous before God, which means all of our sins, past, present, future, all of our sins can be washed away because of what Jesus did on the cross. He paid the price for you. So do I have to go, go leave and kick my addictions and, 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 and become a better person out there and come back and present myself as good to God? No, don't even try to do that because your attempts to be good enough for God will never work. And God knew that. So he made Jesus good enough for you. Jesus was made good enough for you so that you can receive forgiveness. You don't have to try and be a good person. Jesus already did that for you. So what do I do? This is what we do, church. We repent, which means we turn away from our life. We say, I changed my mind. I changed my mind and how I've been living, and I turn to God. And then we put our faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. That's it. I don't have to try and change. I just, I just turn in my life to God. And let him renew my mind and my heart and my life. Tonight is the night. Tonight is the night. We're turning our lives in. We're repenting and we're putting our faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you the option right now. If you're ready to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if, you're, if you know you're saved, I need you to pray. Pray for those that need to receive Jesus. But right now, if you're saying, I do not know that I'm saved, but I know that I need Jesus. I know that I need forgiveness of my sins. I want to, I know, I want to know that if I were to die tonight, I wouldn't end up in hell for eternity, but I would be in heaven with God forever. I want to give my, I want to give God my life and my everything. If that's you, when I count to three, I want you to boldly raise your hand. And before everybody here, you're saying, I am giving my life to Jesus Christ tonight. When I count to three, are you ready, church? Are we ready? Here we go. One, if that's you, you're saying that's me. I need to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Two, you're saying I need forgiveness of my sins and I need salvation. I need Jesus Christ in my heart. If that's you, boldly raise your hand. One, two, three, hands up. If you're saying that's me, I see your hand, I'm proud of you. I see your hand, two hands back there, I'm really proud of you. I see your hand back there in the back row. I see your hand up here, I'm proud of you. I see your hand, I'm proud of you. I see your hand right here. Anybody else, I see your hand. I see your hand back there, come on church. I, this is where we celebrate, I see your hand. I see your hand. Anybody else, you're saying that's me, I wanna receive Jesus. I wanna ask you to do one more thing. Will you do me a favor, if you raise your hand, even if you're in the back row, if you're in the center, will you make your way out to the aisle and come forward because we want to pray with you and congratulate you and, and love you and help you and, and, and get excited for you. Church, right now is where we get excited, we clap, we praise God, and we celebrate people giving their lives to Jesus. Don't stop clapping. Don't stop clapping. They're still coming. They're still coming. We celebrate every soul. We celebrate every life. We celebrate every person. Angels in heaven right now are celebrating for every person that's making the way forward. And we will do the same. We're proud of you. We're proud of you. Come on. God is so good. There's still time. If you need to be up here. If you need to give your life to Jesus, come forward. Tonight is a night. We don't know if tomorrow's promise. Don't put it off another day. Make your way forward. Let's give your life to Jesus. Tonight is a night. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. Come on, they're still coming. Let's give them a, a round of applause. They made their way forward. God is so good. For everyone that came forward, for everyone that came forward right now, I just want you to look up here for a second. We, we, we're we celebrating with you right now. It's the greatest decision you ever make in your life, following Jesus. We're proud of you. We're going to help you. The Holy Spirit, he's going to be your helper, your guide. Your next step is to get baptized. What's your next step? To get baptized. The person in front of you, they're gonna pray with you and they're gonna help you to get signed up to get baptized. And also we have a class called Holy Warriors. 
This class is gonna train you and equip you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We're gonna help you to read your word. We're gonna help you to fight in this fight of faith. We're gonna help you to pray and teach you all of these tools and these weapons to live out for, live your life for Jesus. We can't do this on our own, we need each other. The person in front of you, they're gonna pray with you and they're gonna help you get signed up for the class. Are you ready? Are you ready for this, the rest of your life? What God is gonna to begin to do in you has never happened before. God's gonna do a new thing. Let's pray right now. Church, let's close our eyes. Let's bow our heads. I want you to repeat after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for loving me, for giving your, Father, thank you for giving your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for my sins. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you rose from the dead and you purchased my salvation and my freedom and my healing. From this moment forward, my faith is in you. You are my Lord and my Savior. Renew my mind. Renew my heart. Give me your desires. And I will live out your plan for my life. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Make me a new creation. And from this day forward, my life will never be the same. I belong to you. My life belongs to you. My mind belongs to you. My soul belongs to you. I am yours. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Church, can we give God praise for all those that received Jesus Christ tonight? Now, don't forget, we got a lot of things happening right now. Sunday, we're going to receive a word from God. You want to be there. And remember, next Wednesday, we're talking about abortion you're going to want to fill this place out invite friends and family let people know my church is talking about abortion next wednesday you're going to want to be here come early get a great seat we love you church don't forget this friday for all the young adults be here at 7 p.m we have an awesome awesome service planned out for all the young adults in the house and ladies register for women's conference you still have time don't wait until it's too late register tonight for women's conference we love you church remember if god is for you there's no one who can come against you if you need prayer come forward we love to pray with you god bless you church